Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, delegates. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I would say you are the few, the proud, the brave, but there's a lot of you here uh, who stuck around for the last day, and uh, and I think that's uh, probably pretty uh, uh, pretty much because of the content of today's session. So we want to thank you very much for joining us here today. They say timing is everything, and uh, obviously we knew that this session on cannabis implementation would be topical uh, for AMO um, when we started planning the conference last fall. The provincial uh, retail approach has changed recently, as we all know, and uh, many of you have been talking throughout the AMO conference to cabinet ministers, MPPs, and each other about how this may play out on the ground in our communities, in your communities, as of April 1st, 2019. Uh, the title for the AMO conference is extremely apt, In Conversation, and that's certainly what we have had the opportunity to have over the last few days. I do want to uh, take a moment to point out that I believe um, the Attorney General, uh, Mulroney, has joined us this morning. She was planning, she was here earlier, and she was planning to make her way in, so I know she, uh, if not here right now, yes, she's over there. Thank you very much, uh, General, for joining us. As we are talking and asking questions about the future of retail stores, we also know that online sales uh, will be starting October 17th across Ontario less than two months from now. Today's panel will be presenting on what they know from their respective fields and perspectives, and many will be asking the same questions that you were asking. Many of us will be asking the same questions uh, that, that they will be uh, attempting to answer. Now, we may not get all the answers today that we're looking for, but it is our hope that by the end of this session, you know more than you know now about the implementation of recreational cannabis legalization. I'd now like to uh, introduce our three provincial officials who will be starting today's session with a joint presentation to you. Uh, I'm going to introduce them. They'll present, and, um, and then we'll introduce uh, our other distinguished guests who have joined us. Renu Kalendran is the executive director of, where are you, Renu? There you are. Uh, executive director of the Ontario Legalization of Cannabis Secretariat at the Ontario Ministry of the Attorney General, which is responsible for developing and coordinating Ontario's approach to the federal government's legalization of recreational cannabis. Previously, she was the assistant deputy minister of the Consumer Services Operations Division in the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, responsible for delivering consumer complaint, regulatory compliance, and enforcement. Renew has extensive experience in social and economic resource policy development and managing complex enforcement and compliance issues and has held leadership positions in the Ministries of Labour, Community Safety and Correctional Services, Education and the Cabinet Office. Prior to joining the Ministry of Children and Youth Services in 2016 as an Assistant Deputy Minister, ADM of Youth Justice Services, David Mitchell, was the Regional Director of Central Region Community Services in the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, where he was responsible for the administration and oversight of probation and parole services in the Central Region. He has over 27 years of progressive experience within MCSCS and has previously held management roles in probation and parole in a number of correctional institutions and founded the Ontario Correctional Intelligence Unit. Throughout his career and as a volunteer, David has been a leader on youth and community issues. This includes playing a leading role in bringing together community stakeholders with member associations representing the business, legal and policing sectors to identify opportunities to prevent young people from engaging in gun violence and providing them with community programs and job training. And finally, on the provincial side, Nicole Stewart is the executive lead cannabis retail implementation project at the Ministry of Finance. She and her team work closely with the Ministry of the Attorney General um, to support their work in leading and coordinating the policy work on the provincial framework for the regulation of cannabis. Prior to her work at the Ministry of Finance and over the past 18 years, Nicole has worked in a variety of Ontario ministries, including the Ministries of Government and Consumer Services Infrastructure and Culture. Nicole has broad expertise in regulatory policy, including the areas of beverage, alcohol, electrical safety, technical safety, and underground infrastructure. And ladies and gentlemen, I will invite Renu to the podium to begin their joint presentation, uh, after which we'll have some questions. Renu. Thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Can you hear me okay? Good. 
So I will uh, move forward with the slides then. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the federal framework and how our provincial framework nestles into that. Um, in April of 2017, the government, the federal government introduced legislation, uh, the Federal Cannabis Act, to legalize and regulate uh, rec recreational cannabis in Canada. That act received royal assent in June and will come into force oct in October 17th of this year. This federal act establishes the overarching legislative framework for cannabis in Canada and includes rules for producing, distributing, selling, and possessing cannabis. With regards to licensing and production, the federal government will continue to regulate and provide oversight of production, cultivation, and processing of cannabis through a licensing regime, as well as continue to regulate the production and sale of cannabis for medical purposes. Provinces and territories are authorized to distribute and sell can recreational cannabis, and so I'm going to be focusing on what Ontario's approach will be in a minute. The Federal Cannabis Act also establishes youth access restrictions and sets a national minimum age of 18 for possession of cannabis. However, it would be not be an offense under the federal legislation for youth to possess up to five grams of cannabis. For adults, there will be a 30 gram public possession limit of legal dry cannabis. Adults will be permitted to grow up to four plants per residence for personal use. Please note that this means four plants per residence, not per adult. It is also important to note that provinces and territories do have the ability to set some of their own rules in the areas of minimum age, places of use of cannabis, and possession of cannabis. So the remainder of the presentation will really focus on our approach. So, so the slide here shows our broad approach. Um, we passed le legislation last December to establish provincial rules for the sale, distribution, purchase, possession, transportation, cultivation, consumption of cannabis. The provincial act will come into force the same time as the federal uh, legislation comes into force on October 17. This is important because the assumptions that I think we've all been working under in terms of what Ontario rules will be remain unchanged and so all the preparatory work that you've been doing to get ready for legalization in, in October with respect to training and other activities are still very important and, uh, and we're working with you to make sure they're on track. The key elements of our legislation include setting a minimum age of 19 above the federal age for recreational use, prohibiting the use of cannabis in public places, workplaces and motor vehicles, including boats, and prohibiting youth from under the age of 19 from possessing cannabis and providing provincial tools to address the illegal market, which I'll discuss more on the next slide. Generally, municipalities will retain all cannabis uh, Act 2017 fine revenues. <coughs> so just a bit about some of the, our broader implementation activities. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some public education and our broad coordinated strategy across ministries to help support uh, knowledge and awareness around cannabis use. Across government, ministries such as uh, health and long-term care, education, and labor, transportation, among others, are leading a variety of education, prevention, and harm reduction activities, particularly with children and youth in mind. Public education is critical in the lead-up to legalization, and we're working hard to ensure that families and children are equipped with the tools that they need. Part of this is uh, a provincial rules campaign that we are developing that we will be launching shortly to ensure that there is broad understanding of our rules and that uh, and working with the federal government around a household a householder uh, campaign so that we are ensuring that every Ontarian has access to, to good information to make informed decisions about cannabis use. In terms of youth diversion, my colleague David Mitchell will be talking a little bit more about what uh, his ministry is doing to implement this, but it is a, a key objective of the Cannabis Act to prevent youth from unnecessarily being brought into the provincial and the criminal justice system. 
So the Cannabis Act 2017 provides police prosecutors and courts with the opportunity to refer young people to prevention and education programs approved by the Attorney General. Uh, one, one more thing that I wanted to talk about was in enforcement and the Cannabis Act prohibits any person from selling or, or distributing recreational cannabis other than the Ontario Cannabis Store. The Act also prohibits landlords from knowing and permitting activities in these premises, including the provision of an interim closure authority to appropriately uh, to, to ensure that appropriate and designated public safety personnel can address the use of illegal storefronts. So there's greater flexibility in these tools and it's something that we heard from municipalities that they needed as well. On impaired driving, um, as of this July, Ontario has even tougher drug impaired driving laws. We work closely with public health and safety experts, police and federal and municipal governments to develop the new measures, which build on Ontario's recent action to align penalties for drug impaired driving with those already in place for drunk drivers. The new laws include zero tolerance for young and novice drivers and all commercial drivers. Higher penalties for impaired driving will come into force on January 1st, 2019. And I believe my colleague, um, Chief Larkin, will be talking a little bit more about some of those training ac activities that are underway. At this point, I am going to turn things over to my colleague, David Mitchell, to again talk a little bit more about uh, youth diversion. Good morning. Good morning. Did Amo not feed you this morning? <laughs> well, good, morning. good morning. Thank you. And I'd like to uh, thank Amo for uh, inviting the province to share uh, our information. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and speak with you about the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services related activities in response to the legalization of cannabis. As previously mentioned, in an effort to keep our community safe and healthy, one of Ontario's key priorities is the protection of youth. Accordingly, that would help if I advance the slide. Uh, accordingly, uh, the census in Canada in 2016, there are approximately uh, 2.1 million youth aged between the age, ages of 13 to 24 in Ontario. Youth in Ontario have the highest rates of cannabis use compared to other age groups. For example, in 2017, we know that 19% of grade 12 students, 7 to 12 students, had used cannabis in the past year. And 38% of young adults between the ages of 18 and 29 years versus 14.5% of all adults. In 2016-17, the Youth Justice Services Division that I'm responsible for collected data on the frequency of cannabis use by youth receiving probation services across the province. These youth would have been between the ages of 12 and 18 at the time of their offense. Of those youth known to probation officers at the time of the survey, on average, 69% were known to have regular or occasional cannabis use, and 36% were reported to have harmful impacts on their life due to cannabis use. In light of the legalization of cannabis, this data suggests that there is a need to provide enhanced supports in the form of education, awareness, and prevention that promotes harm reduction approaches as well as diverts youth who come into contact with the law for cannabis related reasons. And that can also be appropriately dealt with outside of the formal court system. We in the Youth Justice Services Division know that by addressing challenges earlier through prevention and diversion, we can mitigate against youth and young adults from becoming further involved in the justice system and provide them with the supports that they need to improve their lives. We also know that education, prevention and diversion and positive experiences are effective ways to keep youth and young adults from coming into contact with the law. As previously mentioned in Ontario, youth and young adults under 19, year old, 19 years old will be prohibited from using, selling, distributing, purchasing, transporting or cultivating cannabis. Section 20 of the Provincial Cannabis Act uh, provides law enforcement with the authority to refer youth under the age of 19 to youth education diversion program approved by the Ministry of the Attorney General. This means that youth under the age of 19 found with cannabis 
by law enforcement may have the opportunity to be diverted into a prevention and education program to ensure that they are not unnecessarily brought further into contact with the justice system. Accordingly, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, through my division, is developing and implementing a cannabis youth diversion program to respond to Section 20 of the Provincial Cannabis Act. The Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services is partnering with the Ministry of the Attorney General and, uh, and uh, Springboard Services to develop customized online youth education and prevention programs for youth under the age of 19 that come into contact with the justice system for certain cannabis-related offenses. This program will be available by October 17, 2018 to align with the proclamation date. The program can be utilized both pre- and post-charge and would serve as an alternative to fines and other judicial sanctions. In efforts to prevent further involvement in the justice system of youth and young adults under the age of 19, the program will enhance awareness, knowledge, and prevention strategies of cannabis use. Earlier, I made reference to the cannabis legislation, specifically Section 20, that enables police officers and other authorized persons, such as prosecutors, to refer youth to an education diversion program approved by the Ministry of the Attorney General. This will include the Cannabis Youth Diversion Program. Other authorized persons in law enforcement sector will be able to make referrals to this program, and they include special constables, First Nations constables, and other designated provincial offenses officers. Therefore, youth will be able to access the program through the court or law enforcement. We anticipate with the implementation of the Cannabis Youth Diversion Program, youth in those age 18 will gain improved functioning <coughs> and positive social behaviors by learning more about the harms and risk of cannabis use. The program will equip youth up to and including 18 years old with increased skills, abilities, so they are able to use them when making decisions about cannabis use. Youth and young adults 18 will be engaged with additional supports through the program that provide resources, services and programs that could meet many of their needs. Other intended outcomes of the program will include an increase in the number of youth and those 18 diverted from the justice system and decrease of cannabis related offenses. This program will be the first available diversion program in Ontario for youth and young adults aged 18 for cannabis-related offenses. We will monitor and evaluate our progress and identify future areas for improvement. Our division has worked closely with our partners to build a validated tracking mechanism that will demonstrate that the provincial footprint, for example, of how many referrals that we make from police courts or receive, rather, from police courts and other authorized sources, and we will capture client feedback the efficacy of the program knowledge gained pre and post, and the risk of cannabis use, understanding of information shared and how to make informed decisions related to cannabis, and the awareness about resources, services, and programs available to help the youth and those who are 18. These mechanisms will inform further program enhancements and the delivery to youth and referring partners across the province. Finally, Ontario will be prepared to support youth and young adults with cannabis-related offenses to promote diversion from the justice system and provide the most updated information to fully inform and educate youth and young adults to be able to make the best choices in life. The diversion program will be a vector of change to promote these outcomes for our youth. I look forward to working with and sharing more with you following the proclamation of the cannabis legislation and the launch of the Cannabis Youth Division. I'll now turn the pres presentation over to Nicole. Nicole? Thank you, David. All right. Good morning, everyone. So, the federal government has put in, a num in place a number of legislative and regulatory <coughs> requirements that control and influence how provincial retail and distribution systems may be designed and operated. For example, retailers must source supply from federally licensed producers. Products cannot be visible to youth and must be sold from behind the counter. Products will be sold in plain packaging and with specific labeling requirements. 
and there are restrictions on marketing, advertising, and promotions. Ontario's retail system must and will build on these federal requirements. Ontario's retail system also needs to meet the overall objectives of legalization, which are to protect youth and eliminate the illegal market. To meet these objectives, when cannabis is legalized in Canada on October 17th, the Ontario Cannabis Store will launch a safe and secure online channel for recreational cannabis. <laughs> and in doing so, Ontario will meet that federal obligation that provinces be ready for retail and distribution for the start of legalization. From day one, consumers will be able to buy from the Ontario Cannabis Store website and have their purchases delivered to their home or picked up at the post office. The government is confident that the OCS, the Ontario Cannabis Store, will sell cannabis safely and securely online. Ontario is also moving forward with a private retail store model to help eliminate the illegal market. Ontario will introduce legislation for a private retail store model that, if passed, would be launched by April 1st 2019. Ontario will make sure that private retail stores will be regulated with the protection of children and youth as the top priority. The Ontario Cannabis Store website will provide customers with a modern, safe and secure web platform that is optimized for mobile but responsive in design to all screen sizes. The website will um, retail a wide selection of cannabis products and provide social responsibility content, including guidelines on responsible use and health-related support resources. Consumers who are 19 years of age or older will be able to buy cannabis from the Ontario Cannabis website after verifying their age. Purchases will be limited to no more than 30 grams to comply with the federal government's possession limits. Identification, age verification, and signature will be required when packages are delivered to the door or picked up at the post office, and no packages will, left, will be left unattended. In advance of the launch, the Ontario Cannabis Store will provide customers with more background on services and on the retail experience. <coughs> From this jurisdictional map, you can see that most provinces will provide government online, sorry, government operated online sales for cannabis come legalization this fall. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta are also moving ahead with private retail stores. And the government will draw on learnings <coughs> as, as on their learnings as it develops the private store system that makes sense for Ontario. In addition to learning from other provinces, the government will consult with key partners such as municipalities, First Nations organizations, and police associations to inform its plans. These focused consultations will help determine the parameters necessary to enable legal private stores as soon as possible while keeping the protection of children and youth as our top priority. The design elements of a private retail store that will be consulted on include the types of eligible businesses and the rules by which they would operate, the roles of municipalities and First Nations communities, how to protect youth and children, and how to protect against intervention by organized crime and the diversion of product. The government intends to move quickly to enable private retail stores and we have launched our consultations. This consultation will inform the government's development of the regulatory framework, which includes consideration of provincial oversight to ensure compliance in private and public safety, including the consideration of a role for the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario in this regard. Municipalities will be critically important to the successful implementation of a private retail store model, and we will be working with you on an ongoing basis with the support and facilitation of AMO. We will be working with AMO to establish a process for continued engagement on regulatory development and throughout program implementation. As part of last week's announcement, the government stated that municipalities will have a one-time opt-out window under which they can choose to opt out of permitting 
physical cannabis retail stores within their boundaries. The opt-out window will be a one-time period, and the government will communicate the specific start and end dates within which the municipality can opt out. If a municipality chooses to opt out, it could in the future decide to opt back in. We would expect the question of opting out to be a first order of business for councils following the municipal elections. And the government is considering the details of how opting out would work. And so we're very interested to hear your views as part of the consultation. Municipalities are key partners in the implementation of cannabis legalization across the province. And to support the costs related to legalization, the province will be providing $40 million in funding over two years to all municipalities. All municipalities will receive at least $10,000 in total. And if the province's portion of the federal excise duty revenue on recreational cannabis exceeds $100 million in the first two years of legalization, municipalities will receive 50% of the surplus. The government is now consulting on how the funding over that $10,000 floor would be allocated to municipalities. So for example, uh, the allocation could be on a per population basis rather than a per household basis. And the government is also considering whether municipalities who choose to opt out should be eligible for funding. And again, this is a question that we want to hear your views on. What is the appropriate distribution of the funding above 10,000? This funding complements provincial initiatives to address road safety and combat the illegal market. The government will continue to work with municipalities, law enforcement, key stakeholders, and others to make sure that Ontario's youth, roads, and communities are safe. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to our, uh, to our speakers. And uh, I know we want to get to our other panel guests, um, but I do want to uh, direct at least one question each to uh, each of our panelists, and we'll see how we do in terms of timing for the answers. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Nicole, if that's all right. You just um, uh, kind of walked us through the, uh, the opt-out um, option a little bit. Um, now, you, you uh, didn't quite pin down the timing on the opt-out, so I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on that about where the Ministry's thinking is about uh, the timing of the opt-out option. And, and other, other than that, what kind of decision-making roles will municipalities have uh, in a private retail model? What other powers do you envision that the municipalities will get to exercise? Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. I hope everyone can hear me. Okay. Um, so, yes, so the opt-out will be a one-time window, and that window, uh, if you consider the time frame that we have uh, to work towards uh, having a retail, a private retail store system launched for April 1st, uh, then you can consider that we would be introducing legislation over the fall, a very quick period of time. What that means, though, is that municipalities will have more details about what the retail system will look like and and the municipal role within that retail system um, by the time that the municipal elections are completed. And so um, while we haven't determined the specific start and end date, it will certainly be communicated um, prior to the end of the municipal elections. It will likely be quite a short window to meet those timelines that we're trying to achieve for April. And so for that reason, municipalities should plan to consider this question um, as a first order of business uh, when they return after the, the municipal elections are completed, um, which is, I think your first meetings are in December. Um, and so that would be something that you would want to consider in terms of your timelines. Um, we will be engaging with AMO uh, as we're developing that s the private retail store model. And so um, that's another avenue for more information to support your council's considerations. and. Uh, your staff may wish to develop reports to support those as well. We do understand that, that the timing is, um, is near to us and, uh, and there will be lots to consider ahead. Um, so we will work with AMO as much as possible to support you in your considerations. 
Um, I would note too that in relation to the opt-out, um, we are considering that point about funding and how we should distribute the funding in consideration of um, different municipal costs municipalities may incur in relation to overall retailing and, um, and then legalization across municipalities. When it comes to municipal decision making, um, that is really a key focus of the consultation that we have. Um, we are at the, at the beginning stages of developing the um, retail store model and the question of the municipal role is, uh, is certainly a key one for both the province and municipalities. Um, and we want to know from you your thoughts. Um, what types of decisions are important to your municipalities? And how do we find that balance between having uh, the balance of having both local say and at the same time keeping costs to a minimum for municipalities and for the province. So how do we find that efficient way to support local decision in the community? Um, uh, Renee, did you want to add anything to what you said? No, I mean, uh, part of that consultation will, will include consideration of um, a provincial role around regulation. So uh, I mentioned that, uh, Nicole mentioned consideration of the Alcohol and Gaming Commission. And so that's really something that we want to talk about in the context of, of those additional potential costs uh, for really being able to ensure that there's clear uh, roles and responsibilities for all regulators in the system and that the province is doing what it can to support municipalities around licensing and enforcement questions. Well, thank you very much, Nicole. So, Renu, on that, I'm just going to ask you to go a little bit further. So, how will the enforcement of places of consumption restrictions for recreational and medical cannabis uh, work? Sure. So, um, I'll start with recreational. So, as I mentioned, um, there are uh, places of use rules on, under the Provincial Cannabis Act. Um, and, but the act allows flexibility in terms of designating um, uh, different kinds of officers to enforce those provisions. So for example, uh, you know, that means that uh, police officers and provincial offenses officers, including if designated municipal bylaw officers, could, uh, could enforce various prohibitions. And um, this, this response to, uh, to feedback that we heard from some municipalities about wanting flexibility for community-specific approaches in this regard. Um, so we're going to be working with AMO to establish a clear process for municipalities who are interested in a designation request. And we've already had um, been approached by a couple of municipalities who are quite interested in taking a, a flexible approach. On medical, um, places of use prohibitions for recreational cannabis do not generally apply to a medical cannabis users subject to restrictions on smoking and vaping that are part of the Smoke-Free Ontario Act 2017. As you may be aware, the, um, the Smoke-Free Ontario Act has been paused to allow for further consultation specifically around vaping, and, but we are working very closely with our colleagues at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and Public Health to ensure that we do have a framework in place prior to legalization for the use of, of medical cannabis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, David, uh, last question to you um, on the provincial side uh, of our panel. So you spoke a little bit about the diversion program when you were talking in your uh, part of the slide deck. So how will designated provincial offenses officers refer uh, youth and young adults um, aged 18 to the cannabis diversion program? So the process for uh, referral for um, diversion, the diversion program is currently being streamlined and worked on so that either courts, uh, police, or other designated officials uh, can make the referral. It'll be easy and we will be consulting directly with agencies uh, in terms of it. So whether or not it's going to be directly electronic or in the courthouse, uh, we're going to facilitate a system where we're working with both the Ministry of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Community and Safety, Community Safety and Correctional Services, which are responsible for young adults 18 and over in order to make that a, uh, a seamless process as possible. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for that discussion and that presentation. Um, I'm now gonna pivot and introduce uh, our final set of speakers today in the order that they're gonna be speaking. So, Chief Brian Larkin was appointed as the seventh Chief of Police in the Waterloo Regional Police Service on August 31st, 2014 by the Waterloo Regional Police Services Board. 
Brian began working uh, his policing career in 1991 as a member of the Waterloo Regional Police Service, working as a frontline constable assigned to Division 1 in Kitchener. Over the course of his career, Brian has held a number of progressively responsible positions, including community and media relations, traffic services, executive officer to the chief of police, and the superintendent of Central Division. Chief Larkin is an active member of the Canadian and Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police. He serves the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police as past president and is the co-chair of the Provincial Police Joint Health and Safety Committee. Brian also serves as the co-chair on the CACP Drug Advisory Committee. After uh, the chief, our next speaker, will, uh, he will turn to Joy Halton. Joy is the regional solicitor for the regional municipality of York. She first joined York Region as the Director of Employment and Labour Law in 1997 and was appointed as Regional Solicitor in 2004. As Regional Solicitor, Joy heads the Legal and Court Services Department, which includes oversight of the second largest provincial offences court program in Ontario. Joy is actively involved in a number of municipal advocacy <coughs> committees. She is a founding member of the Emergency Services Steering Committee and the chair of the ESSC Legislative Review Committee. In this role, she leads the ESSC's advocacy for reform of the interest arbitration system. She is also a frequent speaker and advocate for legislative reform to improve the delivery of municipal services, particularly in the emergency services sector. And she works closely with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario on a variety of legal and policy issues. And we can't thank you enough for that. Joy is a board member of the International Municipal Lawyers Association and an executive member of the Public Sector Lawyers Section of the Ontario Bar Association. And finally, we will hear from Roy, uh, Ray Callery. Ray has been the Chief Administrative Officer in Greater Napanee since 1998 when five municipalities joined in amalgamation. <coughs> Ray started in municipal work in 1988 while completing his university degree at Trent University. Ray holds his CMO designation and his HR designation with Omni and OMHRA, and he is the past president of AMCTO. AMCTO. Uh, he's been part of many AMO task forces over the years and working groups and has helped develop the AMCTO MMAH internship program. And he most recently was at the center of developing uh, changes to the OPP billing review and formula uh, changes. From this work, Ray organized and has chaired for the past two years the OPP discussion group of fellow CAOs that regularly address operating concerns of municipalities with senior representatives of the OPP. So a pretty distinguished panel. We're interested in hearing your feedback, both on what you heard from our ministry guests and your thoughts overall on the cannabis program. Chief. Thanks so much, uh, Mark. Uh, bonjour et bon matin, uh, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, and uh, municipal leaders, what a pleasure it's to be here, and warm greetings to uh, Minister Mulrooney. Uh, thank you for being here today, and what a pleasure it is to be here on behalf of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police and our President, Chief Kim, Kim Greenwood, who couldn't be here as she's meeting with Minister Tobolo this morning on policing issues facing the province. Get a month. There we are. Well, as uh, we head to October 17th, uh, some significant change in public policy in Canada. In fact, it's probably the greatest public policy change we've seen for, uh, since uh, the Narcotics Control Act, and it was upgraded to an enhanced to the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act. So we're seeing some significant change. Obviously, uh, for the last 24 months, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police and the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police have been working very diligently, have been collaborating not only provincially but also nationally and working with all of our stakeholders as we look to the change. And of course, I want to be very clear, the, the police chiefs, this is not new to us. The, the legalization piece has been a part of our dialogue dating back to the 1990s where we talked about decriminalization and a different approach. And we're committed to our focus. Our focus is around youth protection. Our focus is also around removing the significant profits that organized crime entail from the illicit trafficking of cannabis and other drug products. And so we're supportive of the direction. We're supportive of the change. Naturally, this is a significant culture change. It comes with trepidation. It comes with significant questions. It comes with some unanswered questions that we'll have to work our way through as we move forward. But again, significant public policy change as we move forward. I want to assure you, stay calm. <laughs> on October 17th, there will not be reefer madness in Ontario <laughs> or in any of your communities. 
we have to pause for a moment and recognize that cannabis, and you heard some incredible data from David, cannabis is an issue and, a, and, a, and something we've been facing in Canada for many years, in fact, over the last hundred years. And a part of me wishes we could go back in time to the prohibition dialogue, the prohibition discussions, and the same thing that leaders faced back then. But the reality is, is that your Ontario police leaders were ready. Do we have all the answers? Do we have all the tools in place? Do we have all the training in place? No, but we're resilient and we've been working very diligently with the Ontario Police College, with the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, with the Ministry of Attorney General, and we feel very well aligned that on October 17th, when legalization comes in the, into play and the Cannabis Act is proclaimed, that we'll be in a good place. And so it's very important for municipal leaders that you recognize that across Ontario, there's been much dialogue. Policing colleagues have been discussing this. It's been a focus of our platform. We've been heavily involved in many discussions, and that equally goes nationally. As I mentioned, consultation, we've been having this dialogue for a number of years with Public Safety Canada as well as the Ministry. Obviously, over the last couple of years, we've been heavily involved in the, in the development of the Cannabis Act as well as working with our many different partners, whether it be Ministry of Transportation, the Cannabis Secretariat. And again, we look forward to the ongoing dialogue. We believe that on October 17th, even though that there'll be a pro proclamation and the Cannabis Act will come into play, over the next 18 to 36 months, the reality is, is we're gonna need to continue to meet, we're gonna continue to be engaged and have dialogue, and the reality is, is we're naturally, we believe as chiefs, we're gonna have to tweak and make changes to the legislative piece. There's a lot of different things that we will not understand the true intricacies. Of course, we have our top 10 key concerns and moving forward, and what does it look like, and I'll speak to a couple of these uh, more definitely, but obviously training. Training has been a significant impact, um, and this is something that I know the natural feedback and, and the, the natural questions from people is, well, you've had two years to plan. Why aren't you ready? Why aren't you trained? Well, this has been an evolution. Um, I'm very proud of our work with the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, and particularly the Ontario Police College. We've been doing a significant amount of training around standard field sobriety testing, around drug recognition experts, but as I alluded to, driving and drugs has been around for many years. This is just a different approach and we're gonna to have to do things differently. One of our concerns around the training piece, we just launched a nationally in partnership with the RCMP and the Canadian Police Knowledge Network is, a, is an online cannabis training. Uh, it's um, uh, two hours in length. And so the, the impact and the implications of training, uh, there's been significant funding from the government around uh, free registration, et cetera, but it takes away people from the front lines. And obviously there's a cost to municipalities and implication as we backfill, as we have to ensure that we have adequate staffing. Road safety, I'll speak to more, uh, as well as retail and legal dispensaries very shortly. But again, member fitness for duty, obviously there's human resource implications for all of us as we move forward on this. This is not nothing new, but we have to enhance and, and have a greater capacity as we move forward. The financial impact on policing uh, and our budgets, uh, we recognize that over the next uh, two to three years, we, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, we anticipate and we predict about a one to 2% budget depending on the size of the organization on our operating budget. There's some startup costs, there's equipment costs, there's training costs, and obviously some ongoing uh, pieces. Uh, youth diversion model is something the Ontario Chiefs uh, push very hard for want to applaud the, the Ministry of uh, Youth for moving forward on that and developing that in partnership with us. We think it's fantastic. We have to also change our mindset around an upstream model that focuses on prevention. We should be asking ourselves why so many young people choose to use cannabis. The Ontario Chiefs do not support perpetual drug use. We don't think it's a healthy lifestyle. We think it impacts the Ministry of Health. We think it impacts the Ministry of Transportation. And if we truly want to move forward, we also need to focus on prevention, which really goes to our provincial prevention model. We need to ramp this up, and I encourage you as municipal leaders, let's move the dialogue upstream. We're far too reactive on many of these issues, and I'll speak a little bit larger about our, our current drugs issues. And of course, there's a great opportunity to talk about roles, responsibilities, and examine provincial powers. As municipal leaders, your bylaw and licensing, it's a great opportunity for you to enhance regulation and oversight and have those powers. We talked a little bit about uh, the, the uh, drug driving. 
the current status in Ontario, uh, about 18,000 police officers. We've done some significant work, as I alluded to, with the ministry and the Ontario Police College. Uh, we currently have uh, about 4,000 officers, frontline officers, trained in standard field sobriety. We have 301 drug recognition experts. And I can tell you, when you match our numbers of training against any other province, we're in a good place. A lot of great things happening. There's work to be done. That will be ongoing as we continue to move this forward. But we're doing some good things. We believe and, and applaud the decision around uh, novice drivers and commercial drivers, zero abstinence. We did push for all drivers. Um, that was a non-starter, but we'll keep kind of moving that forward as we move forward. And so there's lots of uh, real positive pieces. I think the unknown here for all of us is that uh, we need our federal government to officially approve the device that we'll use. And once again, there'll be an implication on training, an implication on those pieces. And I encourage you as municipal leaders to continue to move that forward. I encourage our provincial leaders to move that forward to get federal government moving forward uh, because we're days away and you can't train an organization, uh, you can't train 18,000 police officers in a device overnight. It takes time. And in fact, uh, come, come October 17th, we will not be ready with the device. That being said, uh, we'll rely on some of our other pieces. I want to talk a little bit about retail stores. Uh, the Ontario, Ontario Association of Chiefs, our position was always uh, around a government relate, regulated control perspective, uh, the LCBO model. Uh, we felt that that was the best model to regulate and to ensure that organized crime did not infiltrate. We recognize that there's a change in that. Our position and our encouragement to municipal leaders is let's regulate. Let's create some significant oversight. Let's give municipalities more powers. Uh, if we're going to a private retail approach, Let's make sure we have all of our ducks in a row uh, to ensure that organized crime, this is a billion dollar business across Canada for organized crime. And for those of you that may be entrepreneurs out there, you just don't take a billion dollars over an organization and they just say, okay, we'll find another funding stream. They're naturally going to be looking for ways and we have to work with our, our provincial and federal partners to ensure that we maintain that. That's one of the key commitments of this legislation and change. Legal dispensaries. Um, very quickly, uh, as my time comes to a run here, um, as we move towards um, the deferral date to April of 2019, there will be an impact on municipalities. Um, we recognize that people will go to the online cannabis store to purchase. The reality is, is that illegal dispensaries will continue to operate. There'll be an impact on licensing, there'll be an impact on bylaw services, and so we need to look at strategies to work with the province around how are we gonna fund a policing model that deals with this. Uh, give you an example, last week in Waterloo, five warrants executed on illegal dispensaries, that's the same place. And eventually federal prosecution saying, don't, don't come anymore, work on this from a licensing, work on this from a Landlord Tenant Act perspective, we're not pushing them into the federal court system. So again, municipal leaders, keep your eye on this as we move forward. In closing, we have the perfect storm as leaders. And we have the perfect storm to work collaboratively at all levels. Yes, there's many unanswered questions, but we have a great opportunity for change and change management within our communities. As David alluded to, young people continue to turn to drugs and across our communities in Ontario and across Canada, we have a larger issue. We have an opiate crisis. And so if we get this right and we start to change some of the things that we do as leaders and as municipal leaders and as police leaders and work with all levels, we will shape good public policy. Thanks very much. I'd like to turn it over to Joy from York Region. Thank you very much, Chief. So I'm going to pick up both where the Chief left off, but also uh, some of the comments that were made in the earlier questions. And that is talking about the gaps uh, and the things that municipalities need to be ready. We're hearing a lot about readiness. And in, in my view, I think as municipalities, we are not ready. And I want to highlight the areas and the help that we need to come closer to being ready. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the legislation in detail, but um, get it back. it's not working. Uh, but just to let you know that we are obviously impacted by this legislation. And although the Cannabis Act has been proclaimed into force for October 17th, it's the regulations that we really need to be concerned about. The devil is always in the details. And this legislation, is, as our provincial speaker has described it, is a framework. It provides the high level. But we need the details to know how it's actually going to be implemented and enforced on the ground. 
We've had very good working relationship with the provincial staff on this file to date, and we look forward to continuing that. And I'm glad to hear um, that the timeliness is of a concern to them as it is to us. Uh, the other area of concern that was mentioned is the pause in the Smoke-Free Ontario Act. And I will talk a little bit more about that, but uh, I'm, I was very glad to hear, along with all of you, that uh, there's an interest in moving forward with the, the getting that proclaimed, uh, because that is a significant gap for all of us. So this is just a high-level list of the types of areas of uh, municipal programming and administration that is likely to be impacted by the legalization of recreational cannabis. It will vary depending on the nature of your municipality. So in upper tier, we have policing, paramedic services, um, uh, public health and courts. Uh, the local and single tier will be more concerned about bylaw, um, building code, and that type of thing. So all of these areas um, will definitely be impacted. And if you haven't already done so, I encourage you within your municipality, together with your, your upper tier or your other partners, to bring all of these groups together to talk about how it is you are going to respond um, to this new and changing reality in our municipalities. Some of the specific uh, enforcement challenges that we've identified stem largely some, from some of the comments that have already been made. While there is some thought that some aspects of this legislation uh, sh could and perhaps should, in some people's opinion, uh, be um, enforced at the local level. We, you don't have the tools that you need um, for that kind of enforcement. Um, so for example, with public use, the, the ban on public use, police officers have a lot more powers to deal with that. Bylaw enforcement officers in the current legislation do not have powers. So we're concerned that if we are expected to enforce it, uh, we need to have the tools, the training, the resources um, to do that. So that is something that I see uh, as a gap. Um, and that is also the case with respect to home cultivation. Uh, though, although there is the framework of four plants per um, dwelling uh, house or unit, uh, there is no regulation. There is nothing currently in place in Ontario to help regulate um, home cultivation. And that is going to create, I think, a, a big gap where there may be expectations of our communities that we regulate it, but we as municipalities have very little, if any, ability to do so currently. Uh, and I caution municipalities that seek to regulate it on your own without clear legislative authority. If you've tried to regulate things like body rub parlors and adult entertainment uh, facilities in the past, you will understand the challenges that you face when you step outside your clear legislative framework. So, uh, when I hear the comments from my police colleagues and provincial colleagues that this, these areas should be regulated by municipalities, that's an area where we need to talk a lot more about what that looks like and consider the cost and resource implication for all of us. Uh, some of the challenges, the specific challenges we've identified, uh, uh, illegal storefront dispensaries, you know, uh, again, enforcement of the rules. So you heard about the rules. We need some details as to how that's going to be um, enforced. You can expect, I'm sure you are already anticipating complaints from residents about um, uh, odor. So, you know, smoking in your own property will be entirely legal, but could lead to odor complaints. Home growing of four plants will be legal, but if there's overgrowing, it could lead to nuisance complaints. So there's a whole host of, of issues that we need to think about as municipalities. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing in our municipality in York Region is partnering with all of our local and other stakeholders to figure out what our response is going to be. What is our messaging? What is our answer to the question, can't you stop my neighbor from smoking because it's you know, bothering my kids? So you need to think about what your response is going to be to those kinds of things. If you run long-term care facilities, uh, social housing facilities, you have additional concerns as landlords and care providers. And it's particularly concerning to us that the Smoke-Free Ontario Act 2017 has been paused. There is a lot of good regulation and guidance in that legislation, and I, I can't encourage our provincial partners uh, enough um, to move forward in a timely fashion. Even if we only pr see proclamation in parts, um, that leaves a big gap. Um, and I was reminded in an HR session yesterday that as employers, we could all benefit from having the guidance of understanding um, those rules in the workplace. Uh, I put on there public intoxication because right now we have legislation on the books that allow both police and provincial offensive officers to deal with people who are in public intoxicated by alcohol. There's nothing on the books dealing with those that are intoxicated by cannabis. 
So, um, you know, for example, our transit bylaw officers can remove people and deal with people who are on our bus, not necessarily in possession of alcohol, but who are drunk. Um, I don't believe currently that they have the same powers to deal with them if they are high. So this is a significant gap for all of us. Um, so as I mentioned, some of the challenge, challenges, and these are the types of areas that you want to think about being prepared um, to respond to. And we don't currently have the tools, um, but I'm very heartened to hear all of the messaging from the provincial, our partners, that they, they recognize that and they're willing to work with us um, to develop those tools. Uh, I mentioned the Smoke Free Ontario Act. Without its proclamation, we do have this significant gap, and it's particularly concerning if you're responsible for public health enforcement. We just don't know what the rules are around medical use, and it's also going to create a challenge for enforcing public recreational use, because if you encounter someone consuming in public and they say, well, I'm using for medical purposes, this would be my answer right now. I don't know. <laughs> and that's just not a satisfactory place for us to be in. Um, come legalization in October. So we really look forward uh, to more discussions in that particular area. Uh, what tools do we need? So I mentioned a few of them. These are sort of technical issues. Your, your staff who do bylaw enforcement and prosecutions that will mean more to them. Um, if I could highlight a couple, one would be the, the power um, for all um, enforcement officers to require people to identify themselves. Uh, uh, if we're going to do bylaw enforcement of things like home cultivation, we're going to have to look seriously at powers of entry um, and, and those types of powers. There's, there are a lot of good provisions in the Smoke Free Ontario Act that we would encourage the government to look at, um, and, and we would like to see some of those mirrored in the other legislation. So I have to talk quickly about courts because I am responsible for a very large court program, um, second only to uh, in size to Toronto. And, they're not here. Um, we, this is a whole new area for us. So everyone involved in the judicial system is going to have to learn. And I think we can't lose sight of it. I, I agree with Chief Larkin. Cannabis has been around for a long time. But we then have to figure out what is legal, what is not. And this will be new for our judicial system. Um, I want to highlight the bottom bullet point, which is although we appreciate that we will be able to retain provincial offenses, we are concerned that there may be some federal offenses that could end up in our POA courts. And without a legislative fix, we would not see the revenue um, to help offset the program costs. So we would like to see that included in any discussion about um, uh, revenue and relief for municipalities. So finally, uh, I, I, now that everyone's you know, really concerned, um, let's talk about what else is to come. So the federal government has talked about legalizing edible, the, the sale and distribution of edible uh, products a year after legalization. And all I can say is, we are really not ready for that. None of us are. I hope we all agree we need full consultation. All of the things I just talked about will apply um, to the edibles um, along with all the health impacts. And, and so we need consultation from the federal government down. And the same thing, there has been some reference to at some point there may be consideration of legalizing venues for people to consume in public spaces. That has been the experience in the United States. Again, we have not had the opportunity to consult all the things I just said apply, and then some, uh, and so we hope that that would be something that would proceed in a very slow fashion. Um, I take to heart, I've done a lot of speaking alongside some of my American counterparts, and their advice to us is regulate really tightly and perhaps loosen up in the future as cannabis, legalized cannabis becomes part of our normal society. Um, I, I fear that with some of these, we may be doing it in reverse, and if there's any way that we can follow that American advice, um, I think we would all be well served. So that's my very quick overview. I'm going to turn it over to Ray. My role here today is a little bit, this is kind of the speed round, folks. My role is in a very short time to try and expand our minds to think about as many possible operating questions as we can. And really, my presentation is about asking the questions. I don't have all the answers, but I certainly think we need to go back to our municipalities and try and understand what the issues are. First of all, I've heard a lot of conversation about police enforcement and training and courts and sales. But I think from a local government perspective, we need to take a look at how it incrementally eats away at our existing budget. And what are those costs that we may not think about that are going to occur? Not to say that there isn't going to be revenues for many municipalities or a potential revenue stream, 
But I think at first what we need to get our head around is where it may eat away at our traditional budgets, even in small amounts, even in small amounts. But I think we need to understand that. I want you to introduce ERM. ERM is our only bylaw officer for 16,000 people in 200 square miles. ERM is smiling because he retires in December. <laughs> we, we have heard a great deal about the fact of um, regulation. And we're going to regulate probably the fact that we can't smoke in vehicles, we can't smoke on our boats when we're operating them. But turn our heads around to the houseboat parked in your park for the weekend. Is that your temporary residence? And is that smoke going to go across the park? Is there going to be nuisance complaints because of that? The person who sleeps in the back of their truck because that's where their campsite is, what is the implications of nuisance complaints at campgrounds from this? And have we thought about one of the um, biggest unzoned residential campgrounds of all Walmart parking lots? <laughs> We're also going to have social housing. And I think from a bylaw enforcement perspective, that, and, and with all due respect, traditional native lands which I'm adjacent to, in our case it's a Mohawk native lands, they already have, they're out in front, and they already have, in that location, 30 to 40 sales outlets that are occurring, and my residents um, feel that they have a right to, to use those facilities. So, you know, we already have that to deal with from a, a bylaw perspective. Grow ops are of a particular interest um, because I have no idea how many plants it's going to take to damage a property. Co-op grow ops. This is something that's happening where uh, one person takes two or three municipal or personal medical licenses and puts them in one facility. Many of us are already seeing this. What I didn't realize until just I met with the OPP just recently that it's not uncommon for somebody to be growing over a thousand plants for one for one personal use license. So you put that in a in a facility. What does that look like? The issue moving forward is what do grow ops look like? I mean, currently when it's illegal you know what that looks like. What does it look like in a legal environment? Right now we have a relationship with the OPP very closely where if they have a grow up, they go in, they determine it's safe, then they send our, our bylaw staff in, or our building staff in to make sure that's a safe house and what needs to happen. I'm not sure and they're not sure exactly what that protocol is going to look like moving forward, but I think we need to ask those questions. What does it look like for fire inspectors when there's building alterations, change of use? How do our staff get involved in those processes? I think we need to turn our heads to that. Planning and zoning. Lots of issues with planning and zoning. San Francisco tried to get ahead of the curve. In fact, San Francisco has a green map, so before you buy your house, you can see how close you are going to be to a cannabis sales outlet. Thought that was kind of unique. But, you know, how do we treat in our zoning bylaws sales outlets? Are they pharmacies? Are they methadone clinics? Like we treat methadone clinics? What type of restrictions are we going to use? Um, it, obviously, zoning can't be used for prohibition. We've heard about opt in, opt out, but I think we really need to get our heads around what that really means. Uh, and what does it mean for legal non-conforming uses? In our case, we've said that if you grow medical marijuana, it has to be in an industrial zone. Two reasons for that. The first reason is we want it taxed industrial, not residential at the 25%. And I think that has to be a clear message. But the problem with that is, is that when we get into the recreational restrictions and you can have plants in, a rec in residential areas, how do you zone for that? You know, how do you zone for when it's for sales purposes and for personal use. Uh, and who's going, to in, who's going to inspect those sites? Health Canada. We just recently had a person who came in and got a wonderful license to grow tomatoes. Uh, we went out uh, to inspect the structure and find out that there's 4,000 cannabis plants under a medical co-op. Now, we can try and enforce that under our zoning bylaw because it's not an industrial zone. It's in a residential, or it's in a, it's in a sorry, a agricultural, prime agricultural zone. But this can happen overnight. And how much is it going to cost you to enforce your zoning bylaw? Have you ever tried to get a zoning uh, non-compliance through the court system and find out how much that costs you? If you have 12 of these, 14 of these pop up, what's that going to cost you to enforce through your zoning bylaw? And does every farm structure, the interesting part about this is we can't even, when we phoned and said, are these licenses valid, municipalities aren't entitled to that information currently. Only your police department can get that information. Health Canada couldn't answer whether a structure with a roof on it where the plants are in the ground is an inside facility for growing medical marijuana. Is that an outside building or is that an inside building? Please, somebody tell me so I know what to do with the zoning perspective. Health Canada does not have enough people employed to do what's happening across Canada, and I hope that gets addressed as well. 
waste treatment. I have a company that grows medical marijuana. They are not allowed to fly their product over US airspace. How many have garbage currently that goes into the US at any border point? If that garbage truck has a bag of cannabis, which is not necessarily a legal substance, is it gonna get turned around at the border? I don't know. I have no idea. Are you gonna make sure that every truckload doesn't, just to be careful? Has that been addressed? I'm not sure that it's been addressed, but I think you need to ask yourself, what's happening to our waste? How are we gonna treat it? Uh, in Colorado, roots and stalks are treated as hazardous waste because of the chemicals that are used to treat them. So was the wastewater generated off those plants. If you are connected to a water and sewer plant, or a, a wastewater plant, is that gonna be hazardous waste going into your wastewater plant? Is your wastewater plant ready to take products from industrial grow operations? I'm not sure. Outdoor waste. Um, cannabis does have a distinct odor. Some people don't mind it, some people do. Compost has a very distinct odor. You add two, I've got two million square feet of proposed greenhouse for cannabis. You start composting that much cannabis, you're gonna notice it. What are we gonna do with that? And, what are, and, and can we naturally compost it or do we have to deal with it in other ways? I think we need to go home and ask ourselves these questions. How are we operating? And what are the tiny implications that maybe we're not thinking about currently? Health and safety. Section 27 of the Health uh, Ministry of Labor says, we must, we must include mold as one of the protections we have to protect our workers from. If my water meter reader goes in a house, sees cannabis plants, or smells cannabis in the facility, are they gonna be concerned about black mold? And if they are concerned about black mold, what is my duty as an employer to protect that worker on their request or to avoid a work refusal? I'm not sure how far I have to go. When I talk to my local company who deals with mold issues, they're saying that if their employees run into mold, what you see on the screen is exactly what they put on their worker to inspect the mold. That's not to clean it, that's to go in and inspect a facility that has mold in it. Does that mean that my water uh, and sewer change person or my bylaw officer, or my property standards officer is going to put a work request for $600 worth of equipment to go into a house to do their job? I don't know. But I can tell you, a fit machine to make sure that mask fits is $6,000, and right now I might be able to get $10,000 in incremental costs to cover that towards my municipal budget. Emergency and fire services, there's been lots of conversation on edibles. 46% of my calls are, our fire calls are medical in my rural areas. Uh, interesting when we talk about oils, um, oils and edibles will be illegal. If cookies were illegal in Canada, would you make your own? I don't know, but there's a quick Google search. We'll give you 1.6 million recipes. <laughs> what I want to leave you with is I think we all need to go back, take a look at our organizational chart, go down every aspect of our organizational chart and say, how does this affect that department? Think outside the box, take a look at it, we're starting to do that. We're starting to get our heads around it through my general managers, and I think it would be very beneficial for everybody to go home and ask those questions of each department at how that's going to affect you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, um, Ray, and thank you to all of our, uh, all of our panelists up here. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions lined up for you. Um, so first, Joy, you talked, uh, you talked about home cultivation, some of the challenges that you see with that. So can you expand a little bit if, uh, if someone chooses to grow more than four plants of recreational cannabis in their residence, how do you see this being enforced? So um, not easily. <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, Brian and, and every other police chief, including my own, would want me to say, don't just call the police. Um, because although they have more powers than we do, they're, they're not resourced to, you know, look at every home. And as I said, they would still require search warrants and probable cause. Um, so the, the enforcement is going to be very difficult because there is no power to regulate. And this is the kind of thing, if you really want to try to enforce it, we'd have to have some kind of power of inspection or complaint response, uh, certainly something more than what is in place now. 
Um, so it is something that I think municipalities should weigh in on because I, I wouldn't want to suggest that municipalities should be the ones uh, to do this, but I also know uh, that police, this is not you know, their prime business and, and I mean if, if they think it's a grow up, it's going to be within their purview, but if it's you know, my neighbor I think has too many plants and, and their house stinks and it's bugging me, is, is a municipal problem. Um, so, you know, you can look at things like, I know a number of municipalities are looking at their nuisance bylaws, particularly with respect to outdoor growing. Um, maybe odor, although if I put my prosecutor hat on, I would say odor bylaws are virtually impossible to enforce, so I wouldn't put a lot of, of, of energy into that. Um, but I think the key is to try to think about how might you, you know, how involved do you want to be as a municipality uh, and look for those tools. There has been some discussion as well along, I know amongst our local municipalities, looking at property standards, building code, fire code, but again without any regulations to, to prescribe how a homeowner is to grow this, you know, to say you have to certain ventilation or only in certain places, without that framework, uh, what is it we're enforcing? So. I know it's not a very good answer, but that's an honest answer. <laughs> it's okay. We, we have as many questions as we do answers. Um, so, Chief, I'm going to turn to you. Just jumping off of Joy's uh, point, what are your thoughts? We've heard Joy say, you know, we're going to call the police. The police are going to say it's not our responsibility. Um, where are you on uh, how will the police respond if you're called to enforce more than four plants in a residence? Thanks, Mark. I'm kind of hoping it's like wine. People will try it once and realize it's better to go to the store and buy it. But um, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I think it's you know to Joy's part. To Joy's point, I think you have to look at this. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Ontario and Canadian Chiefs. Um, you know, we argued heavily that uh, the province and and federal government should consider. Uh, not allowing it and then you know rolling this through we saw in Australia they did a pair back it was uh, 10 plants per home it's now paired back to one per home but I think we've got to look at it beyond this there's a couple of concerns one is that uh, you know police respond for example for a family violence incident uh, they're dealing with the family violence incident then they realize there's eight plants or six plants in a room so now we have an additional draw on resources uh, to manage that. There's children in the residence and that would trigger us also then to notify Family and Children's Services. So we have to look beyond just simply the four plants. There's gonna be impact on other systems within our community. Uh, very concerned about the home grow, particularly where there's children in the residence. Um, obviously for health perspective, if anybody's ever had the opportunity to view any type of grow operation, um, it's pretty significant, the amount of heat that is uh, generated, the impact on fire services, but um, that's, I think, the dialogue we need to have right now, uh, specifically with, with our, our provincial leaders as well as our municipal leaders, uh, AMO, ex is how do we regulate, how do we enforce, what's our powers of entry? Is it really cost efficient to have a police service, a police officer go back to the division uh, to write a Controlled Drugs and Substance Act warrant to go in and get five plants? Like what's the return on investment? The cost of doing that, uh, the cost of the justice of the peace after hours, uh, the entry into the residence, um, and, and so there's some significant questions around that, um, hence the need, I think, for larger dialogue. Um, I can tell you the Ontario Chiefs, we haven't really grappled around, how are we gonna manage this? Uh, we obviously go to residents uh, every single day, uh, tens of thousands of time across the province, and obviously in plain view, we're going to start to see some of those challenges. So uh, again, don't have the answer, uh, but I think it's time now we, heavily engage in dialogue around what does that look like, what's the powers of, of entry, because I do see that, quite frankly, what I see is this finger pointing. Well, phone, phone the city, phone the region, don't phone us, and quite frankly, it serves nobody well. Um, so collaborative work needed. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm gonna leave the, the police officer now, but I'm gonna, uh, Ray, I wanna talk to you about policing. So Napanee, like 300 plus other Ontario municipalities, you're policed by the OPP. So. How much uh, assistance have you had from the OPP in the preparation for this? And, and how much uh, do you think that other municipalities in Ontario who are policed by the OPP should and can expect uh, from the OPP in terms of assistance? Well, I've, I've been dealing with the Ontario Provincial Police and contract issues since about 1992 in my career. And a lot of the relationship with the OPP is obviously dependent very heavily on the relationship between the municipality and the deta local detachment commander. And I think if you're not having those conversations yet, you better start having them very, very soon as to 
how the detachment plans on trying to deal with specific issues of coordination. And I think it's going to come down to a lot of talking about issues of coordination. From an OPP perspective, um, speaking with senior representatives in the OPP, there is a feeling that there may not be a lot of costing implications from a reactive portion of your policing bill. And the, the model, although the model is trying to get clearer on how policing OPP is billed, I think that there's still a lot of uh, understanding and education that needs to be done on the proactive portion of a police bill and a reactive portion of a police bill. And there's a lot of conversations about codes. Part of my conversation has been, and my concern for every municipality that deals with the Ontario Provincial Police, has been on the costing side and on understanding incremental costs. Because I believe that there may be, or could be potentially, revenue streams in the future um, that we may not be able to access as easily as municipalities that have their own police forces simply because they're tracking their costs differently than uh, an organization that's broad across the province and has a provincial portion and a municipal portion. So I think you need to be asking the questions, what type of codes are we tracking and how are they being tracked? Um, from an operational perspective, I think what it comes down to is understanding where your bylaw staff are going to be required and where the detachment is going to take over. And I don't think that's a lot different than when you have your own force or the Ontario Provincial Police. Um, but you should be having those conversations because our conversations, for instance, around a house that's um, currently being used only to grow plants by somebody from outside the community. They're ordering soil. The house is being filled with soil in the basement. There's soil paper across the windows. The roof is starting to go. Uh, there's reluctance in this time frame of where are we at in the court system, where are we at with the legislation, in who's going to deal with that and how is that going to get dealt with. There's a lot of conversation coming back and forth that, you know what, try your zoning way first. If it's not zoned properly, that may be your best avenue, but that's an extremely expensive and labor-intensive process for the municipality to go through. So I think you need to try and have those conversations now and early. Think about the coordination side. Find out where your detachment commander, because a lot of the detachment commanders right now, there's training organized for them, and I think that they're, they're now into that training. I'm not sure that at this point it's rolled down to frontline training as how specific officers are going to view specific things. So I, to the question about the person who goes, to the officer from OPP who goes to a domestic and sees five plants or six plants, that's going to be somewhat in the officer training and how the, that regulation, and I don't believe the OPP is there yet, to be honest with you. A lot like we're not there asking the right questions yet with our own organizations. So cooperation, identification, of I think your bylaw issues, your zoning issues, and who's going to do what is the first step at the detachment level. But I think you need to think seriously about how the billing, understanding how the billing system works, and asking questions to make sure things are incrementally costed, that things aren't just coded to the old codes, that they create new codes going forward. Okay, well thank you very much. So we have, um, we have about 15 minutes left. I'm gonna start over here on my right um, with you, Dave, and, and I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists to give us some closing thoughts, some final thoughts on advice or observations uh, about uh, how municipal leaders and their staff uh, are getting prepared, should be getting prepared for the implementation of recreational cannabis legalization. So from whatever perspective you want, whether it's something you didn't get an opportunity to touch on or something that perhaps one of the other panelists said that you wanted to speak to, Dave, we'll start with you. I think from uh, where I sit, what's going to be important is our focus on prevention and education. And so in terms of when we talk about protecting young people, it's not just from a health perspective. It's also from a legal perspective in terms of uh, the consequences of illegal use and the fact that it is uh, regulated and, and legislated in terms of being able to ensure that they understand what the law says. And we're already seeing this in different parts of Ontario where Young people have heard it's legal. They haven't heard uh, about the places of use. They haven't heard about the restrictions uh, in terms of age and that lining up with the restrictions uh, similar to alcohol in terms of being under 19. So I think that in that prevention space, uh, looking there, also looking at and realigning how we look at productivity and measuring productivity as it relates to other uh, enforcement entities so we don't, hopefully we don't get uh, because of the focus now 
um, in terms of whether it be by law or folks that are, have special constables in municipalities that we don't get, see more and more uh, enforcement around that, uh, especially for young people, that we encourage them to look at diversion. So I think those would be the two big things for me is the, the issue of uh, preventative education from a legal uh, and uh, health perspective, which we, we are supporting and, and, and going to be doing, and also looking at what we consider to be productivity as it relates to these other non-police entities as it relates to enforcement. Okay, thank you very much. Nicole? Thank you. Um, I think what I would encourage uh, municipalities to consider as, as part of the question around the, the municipal role and, and the degree and the types of involvement that municipalities are interested in, I would encourage people to look at uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, who have you know, set in place uh, roles for municipalities and the types of decision making um, and the balance between the provincial role and the municipal role. I think those are helpful examples that uh, can give you a bit of a foundation to ask questions about what's important for your communities and, and the type of role that would be, uh, would be useful for municipalities as part of the retail store model. Um, uh, that will help uh, too for us in terms of the kinds of feedback that you want to provide. Gives us something concrete to talk about when we think about what's appropriate for Ontario. Okay. Thank you very much. Renew, thoughts? Yeah, just to build on what Nicole said and, and also what uh, what uh, Brian said as well, this is I'm going to need, sorry, get the bug in my throat. <coughs> this is, this is going to be a, a multi-year iterative implementation process and we're going to learn learn as this unfolds and and that whole point of being able to work collectively around some of those uh, issues that have been identified and ones that emerge is going to be really important. I mean, there are things that um, uh, that we're very seized with around enforcement uh, and role clarity and what a role of a provincial regulator might mean as part of that mix in that discussion, and also whether there are some activities that um, w you know, and municipalities have different capacities in terms of bylaw that you that you want a municipal bylaw officer to play versus uh, a police officer or others or a public health um, uh, officer as well. So those are uh, discussions that we want to continue to have with you and AMO has been a good partner and facilitator of some of those consultations and will be immediately after this con uh, conference re-engaging through AMO on some of these these activities. I mentioned that uh, you know we were having discussions around that designation piece in terms of, um, and just to clarify, the Cannabis Act allows that um, the designation of, of, of a, a broad class of, of, of um, uh, enforcement officials to leverage some of those tools and to Joy's point, having further dialogue about what makes sense in that context and further guidance uh, is something that we're really uh, wanting to uh, to move forward on with you. Okay, so I'm just going to come back to to something you, you alluded to a little bit about our planning activities, kind of already underway. So, what what specific uh, thoughts would you have or guidance for municipalities with respect to their planning efforts that have already been underway for some time? We're two months away now from uh, from legalization date. Uh, but with this pivot to the in the retail model to the private sector, mm -hmm. uh, what guidance would you offer to municipalities who perhaps already have task forces, working groups underway? Um, you know, now that there's been a change, what specific things would you say you should really be working on these uh, if you haven't been already? Right. So, um, and I know some of those activities have been uh, in conjunction with provincial partners. So. Uh, in, in the late spring, there was some activity through the Ministry of Education, for example, in terms of providing resources to boards and developing toolkits and others. Um, so I think it's part of that sector-based activity that some municipalities have done in conjunction and public health units have done in conjunction with the province, as well as uh, activities that um, ha they have been uh, working on um, independently. I think um, that there's clarity now that the Cannabis Act has been com 
uh, proclaimed as is. So there's certainty around what those those broad rules are, and the work that you've done to date in terms of, of getting, up, uh, you know, in conjunction with the OPP, getting police trained and starting to look at your own organizations is critical and valuable. In terms of the pivot, what we're looking at is a, is a, a consultation process with key st stakeholders, including uh, AMO and municipalities that uh, Nicole alluded to, that would take us to April, so that we want to re-engage and focus on how that shift in the retail model has an implications for municipalities and enforcement and how uh, a provincial licensing and regulatory regime may help uh, support enforcement in that context. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, so Chief, you had, the, you had probably the, uh, the most colorful presentation with some great pictures in there uh, that, that all made us laugh and I think you know, when you see pictures like that in cartoons, they always make you laugh because uh, they make us think about what's real and the challenge that we're facing. Um, so thoughts from you, you know, the police forces are going to be called upon whether we like it or not, whether you like it or not, uh, to respond when, when people don't know who to call, they call the police. Um, so your thoughts please on, um, on how municipalities uh, navigate moving forward and how you see police forces navigating. Thanks, Mark, and uh, want to change the, the thought process or dialogue a little bit from policing and enforcement to public health and, and to prevention and to building a healthier community. And I think um, that's really where I think, I think reactive, uh, that's the reactive approach is contact the police, have the police come. Uh, you know, we know that uh, uh, diversion can have a significant impact on a young person. If you look at our our rates of use of cannabis and other drugs amongst young people, uh, we should pause for a moment and recognize it's alarming. Uh, we should pause for a moment as municipal leaders and recognize that we've got a substance use challenge in Ontario and in Canada. And so all of the uh, investment in enforcement and regulation, all those things are important and must happen and must occur uh, to build safe communities. Uh, but we have to move the model upstream. I think we're not talking enough about prevention. I think we should be looking at, for example, the Iceland model that has seen cannabis use amongst young people re dr drastically reduced. A and so um, I think the one piece of the dialogue we got to keep involved in this and, and the folks that we need to bring along this journey is public health social services uh, because there's significant impacts and, and they, they're all ripple effects and impacts and so um, that's my uh, it may seem odd coming from a police chief and from the Ontario Association Chiefs of Police that we want to talk a much broader perspective but I think that really we have to move the discussion upstream otherwise um, and it's not that we want to see uh, you know, uh, the private retail of a cannabis store not be successful, but ideally we should be reducing uh, and our goal should be to reduce. Perpetual substance use is not healthy. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's fine that we're moving in this model. We're not arguing that, but I think there's a larger dialogue behind the scenes we should be having, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chief. Joy, you, uh, you know, when, when all else fails, you, uh, you call your lawyer. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, don't do that. Um, so, so I just would reiterate what, uh, what I said earlier, and I think Ray said the same thing, and that is to encourage all of your various program areas to come together with your, whoever does your policing, your public health, um, to think about um, what your response is going to be. And I know our, we have a working group like that in York Region, and one of the things we've tasked them to do is to create communications materials for our public, for our elected officials, for our government officials, because you, you know from this session, we're all leaving this room with more questions than answers, and that's just, that just doesn't cut it um, when we're dealing with you know, our communities. So um, I, I would encourage you to encourage that of your staff um, so that that public information is available so that you have the answers, and the answers may be, I don't have the answers, but said in a much more eloquent uh, communications approved way um, but it's fair game too to educate the community um, I think some of that role always does fall on municipalities uh, formally and informally so we should know what we're talking about and we should be able to you know direct them to the right resources and not do this as you say finger pointing because I fear that's what's going to happen you call the city they say call the police you call the police they say not our you know not our uh, problem so they won't say that but um, 
to avoid that and to move forward. Um, and, and the last point I would say is working together like that will put you in a much better position to participate in the consultation process in a meaningful way. That has been our approach and I know the approach of other municipalities uh, and, and I would encourage municipalities to do that. Okay, well thank you very much, Joy. A lot of, a lot of that feedback, I guess, uh, really echoes what the chief was saying. So municipalities, public health units, really the tip of the spear, I guess, in, in many respects. So Ray, final words to you. Uh, you know, as a CAO, you, you kind of sit atop a municipality and, and look, as many of the CAOs uh, here, of course, do, and, and the municipal leaders. So you have an all-encompassing view of, uh, you're not just limited to one shop, one department. So final thoughts from a CAO on what's coming. Thank you. I think what we need to remember when we leave here is that although this is upon us, there's still a lot more questions than there are answers. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us to go to leave here today to go back and make sure we're asking the right questions. But please do not leave here with the expectation that staff are going to have an answer for every single question that's come up. I think, but you just, that doesn't mean we don't ask the question. That means we look cooperatively at ways at answering those. And the other thing I think that I think everybody needs to remember as we move into this is that every Facebook complaint and every phone call that's a complaint, there's not gonna be a magic municipal pill to solve that problem. And therefore, sometimes a neighbor dispute will be a neighbor dispute. And I think we have to kind of keep that in the back of our minds as we move ahead into all of this. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, cooperatively, we can find solutions as we come through this. Well, thank you very much, Ray. Well said, and it, it always reminds me as we talk about the questions that we have of the old legislative line about question period that it's called question period, not answer period. So um, I want to... <laughs> But I, I do want to thank all of our guests here today for endeavoring as best they can to help us navigate and, uh, and answer the questions that we can answer and certainly uh, together ask the questions that we all collectively need some guidance on. So to our participants here today, I want you to know, of course, that we could go on with this discussion and the other items raised this morning, um, and the other items raised this morning, but we need to close this session now. Uh, but I also want you to know that on behalf of, uh, of AMO, um, we will continue to ask those questions uh, on your behalf of our members and municipalities uh, and to seek further clarity with our provincial partners in the weeks ahead on what we can expect and the need to manage uh, as recreational cannabis becomes legal. Um, one of the gentlemen in the front row just asked for copies of the presentations uh, as takeaways. We can certainly work with, uh, with AMO to ensure that those get posted or distributed. And uh, finally, I would like to thank not just all of you for attending uh, uh, this session. Now, normally, for those of you who are regular AMO attendees, the last day doesn't tend to bring out a whole wave of people, but we almost filled the room here today. Uh, and I think that's really indicative of just how sensitive this issue is and just how important it is to all of our municipalities and all of our residents. So finally, I'd like to thank all of our participants, uh, David, Renu, Nicole, Brian, Joy, Ray, thank you for joining us, for providing your perspective, and I'd like to thank uh, our audience for joining us and ask you to thank our participants as well. Thank you.